Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another edition of the Word of the Day podcast. My name is Jamie Silva, I am your host, and it feels like an age since I've been back here behind the mic pleasantly explaining another useful word to you all. And my saying this is not merely an idle introductory observation. It really and truly has been a while. Our September episode, you may have noticed, was three weeks later than it's technically supposed to be, And here I am, putting fingers to keyboard on this the night of October 30th, with just under 30 hours to go before an entire calendar month will have passed without an episode. Now, despite what we always say about how, you know, just because it's called the Word of the Day podcast, doesn't mean we gotta feature a word every single day. Rather, each episode is just the word of whatever day we release it on. But again, despite this laissez-faire attitude towards show title accuracy, Missing a whole entire month without even being on an official vacation? That's going a bit too far. So, the task before us is simple. Research, craft, record, edit, and release an episode before trick-or-treaters have finished their rounds tomorrow night. Before the autumn sun sets on the month of October. And as I sit here at, let's see here, 8.08pm on All Hallows' Eve Eve, I've got nothing to go on but an idea, a word and my trusty muse of podcasting. He's really bending muse union rules to be here right now, by the way. Muses don't like working overtime. They hate being rushed. But in a way, this is fortunate, this last-minute effort, because there are two things that listeners to the show ask about and write in about, as far as you know. One is wondering, like, what goes on behind the scenes here at the program? How does an episode come together? How long does it take to write and record and all that? How many people are involved in that process? Just how many Word of the Day staff members are there? And are they real? These are all burning questions. The other thing listeners clamor for is more content on non-linguistic, non-etymological matters. They crave miscellaneous tangents, gratuitous gimmickry, and special extra segments that have very little to do with the core mission of this show. So tonight, I'm pleased to fulfill both of these desires at once, after a fashion. You'll get a peek behind the curtain at how I put together the material. Or, should I say, the first draft of the material. Because there will be basically no time to put it through our customarily thorough, rigorous, and really inordinately lengthy review and revision process. In fact, I've sent home the bulk of the staff, including Eddie, our editor, Huey, our humorist, Angie, the engineer, and even Ike, the intern. Only good old producer Pete remains in the studio with me, and honestly, he's not really helping. I just don't think he has anything better to do. And in case you're wondering, by the way, the answer is yes. It is a requirement here at the show that your name has to alliterate with whatever your role is. Unless you're me, of course. And it should be a maximum of two syllables. This may seem controversial, maybe even discriminatory, but Harold in HR says that as long as we allow people to change their legal names or assume a nickname in order to get the job, which we do, then this is fine. So, here we are. Okay, let's see. Okay, 8.36. Time's a-wasting. I'm probably just gonna do, like, one take of the rest of this here. Just seat of the pants, all pack, no parachute. See how it goes. Today's word is the adjective nondescript. I would say this means unremarkable in appearance, not memorable, or not warranting description. So, one might say, you wouldn't know it from the nondescript storefront, But inside that building over there is a charming French restaurant. Here, you're saying the exterior of the building might be dull and easy to overlook. But don't be fooled. There's a cool eatery inside. Turning now to the Google definitions for nondescript, and there are two of them. First, as an adjective, it means, quote, lacking distinctive or interesting features or characteristics, unquote. Yep, totally on board with this. But then, the second definition is of nondescript as a noun, which I didn't know existed before. It simply goes, quote, a nondescript person or thing. And fair enough, this makes sense. Though, I'm pretty sure that it's very rare nowadays, so I wouldn't bother memorizing it or anything. Regarding usage, I mostly hear nondescript used to describe buildings, and occasionally people and other things. So, the sample Google sentence for the adjective goes, quote, She lived in a nondescript suburban apartment block. Which, we can all picture this, right? 
just a boring old, basic, probably banal, which is episode 106, apartment complex, just like all the others. So when you use nondescript, you're sort of saying, hey, whatever you're thinking of for this, that's fine. You're probably right. That's pretty much what it's like. I gotta say, for an author, this word saves you a lot of trouble. Like, instead of painstakingly describing a cottage, you can just be like, it was a nondescript cottage. And enough said. If anything about it was worth describing, hey, I would describe it. But it's just a cottage. Now, some might call this abdicating one's responsibility as a writer. But you know what? If the reader's imagination can do the job with the first image that pops into their head, then why complicate things, you know? And come to think of it, people do this sort of thing all the time. They describe things without actually saying anything about them. Which, on the one hand, seems lazy or maybe indicating an insufficient vocabulary. But also, it often works. Audiences do usually get what you're saying, or at least they get something out of it that makes sense to them. And if the point of communicating, to really oversimplify things, is to just make sense and convey ideas, then sometimes letting people fill in the blank themselves with something they understand and relate to, it's really the best you can possibly do, no? Now, of course, if you take this explain without explaining thing too far, it can get a little frustrating for the listener. Consider the following hypothetical driving direction, which I feel like is not too far removed from some examples I've heard in real life. Ahem. Yeah, so go about a mile, and then you're gonna hang a left, and you can't miss the turn, because it's right after this pretty nondescript whatchamacallit. It kind of looks like that thing from the TV show with that one guy. You know what I'm talking about. Uh, You'll know it when you see it. It just looks like whatever, you know? Oh, and quick addendum there. Most of the time when anyone says, you know, this is exactly what they're doing. They are hoping that you already know what they're talking about so that they don't have to talk about it. They're, They're sort of delegating the descriptive responsibility to the listener. Which, again, maybe this works, maybe it doesn't. Anyway, this all reminds me of this one time that my siblings and I were playing this game, I think catchphrase or taboo, if you've heard of those, where one person gives verbal clues about a given word or object or idea, and their team tries to guess the words that they're hinting at. Basically, charades, but you get to talk instead of doing all the awkward miming and gesturing and whatnot. Well, so this one game, when we were, I think, teenagers, my brother was giving the clues, and and he looks at the word that he drew and hesitantly says, it's a state, and then he pauses for a second, and I say, I guess, Oklahoma. And would you believe it, folks, I was correct. This is probably, like, top five proudest moments for me, and I'm barely joking. Now, this bullseye might seem like pure chance, but actually, I was making a very educated guess. See, and no offense to Oklahoma here, but... If there were something distinctive about the state in question, then my brother would have started saying whatever that was. So when he paused, I knew it had to be a state that is, and again I say, no offense, uh, rather unremarkable, or at least without many qualities or landmarks recognizable to us pretentious and provincial West Coasters. So this narrowed down the pool to a very small number of states, a small number of nondescript states like Oklahoma. And no, by the way, I don't think we were aware at the time of the musical. So there you go. I've never gotten hate mail before, but if this is how it starts, it probably won't actually be that mean, because it'll be from Oklahomans. Anyway, back to the main thread here. So sometimes you can just call something nondescript and leave it at that, like with the cottage. Other times, though, it's more like the French restaurant we talked about before, a nondescript-looking spot that was actually very notable in a hidden way. So, for example, you might see on the news something like this. Folks, if you take a look behind me in the background, you'll notice what might at first seem to be merely a nondescript office building. But authorities have recently discovered that it was actually being used as the headquarters of the notorious Chicago Mafia kingpin Tony Mahoney, a.k.a. Tony Minestrone, a.k.a. Knuckles McGee, a.k.a. Tony Robbins and Shootins and Berglunds. The last one's a little long, I realize, but you gotta have a lot of aliases if you're high up in the mob, and not all of them are gonna be winners. Okay, we've got just one more usage note that's also the rather thin holiday tie-in for this episode. See, a lot of scary, spooky locations might ostensibly be just a nondescript something or other, like a cabin or a warehouse or a decrepit abandoned mansion. 
I mean, each of these might be creaky, dimly lit, and full of perturbing paintings, whose eyes seem to follow you around the room. Or are they looking just over your shoulder at something? Something shadowy that seems to flit out of your periphery whenever you glance around. Hmm, scary. Anyway, these buildings might be vaguely foreboding in a variety of ways, but functionally, architecturally speaking, they don't scream, look out, you know, frights within. But actually, and what a shock it is, turns out they're infested with goblins, ghosts, ghouls, and all that ominous jazz. Which, by the way, if you've never heard ominous jazz, you clearly don't watch enough film noir. Anyway, this makes sense, because part of what makes something scary is the element of surprise. So it's particularly chilling if the Twilight Zone types within the building aren't exactly hanging out a shingle and advertising their presence with a distinctive, menacing exterior. I mean, that would be scary too, don't get me wrong, but in a different, vivid way, not a nondescript way. Okay, let's now get into some literature examples for nondescript. First, we'll do the noun form. Example number one comes from Moby Dick by Herman Melville, edited somewhat for brevity, which, obviously, this is Melville we're talking about. Quote, If I had been astonished at first catching a glimpse of so outlandish an individual as Queequeg circulating among the polite society of a civilized town, that astonishment soon departed upon taking my first daylight stroll through the streets of New Bedford. In thoroughfares near the docks, any considerable seaport will frequently offer to view the strangest-looking nondescripts from foreign parts. But while in other haunts you would see only sailors, in New Bedford, actual cannibals stand chatting at street corners, savages outright, many of whom yet carry on their bones unholy flesh. It makes a stranger stare." Wow. Actual cannibals. Apparently this is going to be a more Halloweenish episode than we thought. Anyway, this example is going to be part of an interesting trend we'll look at, where authors simultaneously call people nondescripts while also describing them clearly and in some detail. Merriam-Webster's main definition of nondescript sheds some light on what initially seems like a contradictory habit. Quote, Belonging or appearing to no particular class or kind, not easily described. Unquote. Okay, so to be clear, this is not how I see people use the word nowadays. Though, in all fairness, basically nobody uses this word, period. That's why we're doing this here episode in the first place. But regardless, it's a pretty different spin, right? Like, instead of something being too boring and too generic to even bother describing, in this sense, nondescript things are so novel and different and weird that they defy description, no matter how much you might try. We come across this sense again in example number two from Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson. Quote, From the side of the hill, which was here steep and stony, a spout of gravel was dislodged and fell rattling and bounding through the trees. My eyes turned instinctively in that direction, and I saw a figure leap with great rapidity behind the trunk of a pine. What it was, whether bear or man or monkey, I could in no wise tell. It seemed dark and shaggy. More I knew not. But the terror of this new apparition brought me to a standstill. I was now, it seemed, cut off on both sides. Behind me, the murderers. Before me, this lurking nondescript. Unquote. Once again, scary stuff, am I right? And gosh, I remember as a kid trick-or-treating as a lurking nondescript, and man, got so much candy. Very frightening. Okay, let's round out our noun examples with the following selection from A Tramp Abroad by Mark Twain. Quote, When I was a boy in a printing office in Missouri, a loose-jointed, long-legged, toe-headed, jeans-clad, countrified cub of about sixteen lounged in one day, and without removing his hands from the depths of his trousers' pockets, or taking off his faded ruin of a slouch hat, whose broken rim hung limp and ragged about his eyes and ears like a bug-eaten cabbage leaf, stared indifferently around, then leaned his hip against the editor's table, crossed his mighty brogans, which are apparently a type of shoe or boot, aimed at a distant fly from a crevice in his upper teeth, laid him low, and said with composure, Where's the boss? And by the way, Twain writes the word wares as W-H-A-R apostrophe S, wars, I think. Anyway, uh, so after some conversation with that boss, this boy was hired on the spot. Continuing. So within ten minutes after we had first glimpsed this nondescript, he was one of us, with his coat off and hard at it. Unquote. 
So again, this is a thoroughly described nondescript. The author Edgar Allan Poe, in The Angel of the Odd, seems to play with this contradiction a bit. Quote, Hereupon I bethought me of looking immediately before my nose, and there, sure enough, confronting me at the table sat a personage nondescript, although not altogether indescribable. Unquote. Okay, personally, I think Edgar is being a little too clever here. Like, either describe the personage, which just means person, by the way, uh, or don't. No need to be coy about it. Man, I can see why this usage has fallen out of favor. It's a little confusing. Now, finally, we come to a couple more conventional, more recognizable literature examples. Using nondescript more in the way we would today, in the adjective form, where like, you fill in the blank yourself. I can't be bothered. It's just too boring and ordinary. The first of these examples is from The Yellow Crayon by E. Phillips Oppenheim. Quote, Lord Robert Folks was a small young man, very carefully groomed, nondescript in appearance. He smiled pleasantly at Mr. Sabin and drew off his gloves. Unquote. Yeah, so this guy's just nondescript. Nothing to say about him. Let's move on. And finally, we have Jack London writing in his book Martin Eden. Quote, There was nothing remarkable about the size of the man's eyes. They were neither large nor small, while their color was a nondescript brown. But in them smoldered a fire, or rather lurked an expression dual and strangely contradictory. Defiant, indomitable, even harsh to excess, they at the same time aroused pity. Martin found himself pitying him, he knew not why, though he was soon to learn. Unquote. Ha, folks, in the biz, that's what we call foreshadowing. Anyway, so this guy, he might be a walking enigma, a fascinating in a pitiable sort of way, but at least his eyes are a normal, nondescript shade of brown. Okay, folks, that'll do it for us. That'll do it for today's show. I'm your host, Jamie Silva. It is now 9.15 p.m. on Halloween night, and I still got to edit this and post it, so yada yada. Hope you liked it. Subscribe, tell a friend. Have a great, gotta go. Bye.